What up, everybody? This is Phil John. Welcome to another episode of Phil John's VIP. Thank you so much for joining me on the special night. It's a Tuesday night. And um, I'm here to bring you more conversation and more guests. Um, thank you for joining me. Thank you for joining me every, 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 every live. You know, I'm so appreciative for those who tune in. I'm appreciative of everyone who's been a huge support. But tonight, I got a special guest. All my guests are really special, but this particular guest I have is a young producer who is uh, who goes for, go under the radar, but his work is so broad and huge that um, I'm so happy to be introducing to him to some of you who may not know that he's the man behind a lot of the beautiful things that you see on television today. I've known him now for about 10 years and we started out doing independent films with his brother, Nico. That's my dude. Um, and he was the first person to bring me on to the ABC series, What Would You Do? Um, which is just iconic and now profound. And all of his work that he's done, all of the work that he's touched as a producer is not only huge, but it's necessary. He's a man with a mission. He's a man with a purpose. He's a man that moves with intention, a new father and a, uh, a, a husband and, and just enjoying the daddy life. I am going to introduce to you all, and it is my pleasure to introduce to you all, Mr. Julian Quinones. So I'm going to bring him on. Hopefully we don't have no glitches. I see him there. So hold on one tight. I'm going to introduce you to Mr. Julian Quinones or Julian, Julian that would be the that would be the proper terminology for it. I think he's coming. I think he's coming. There he is. Is this working? It works. There he is. Right. <laughs> you know, I, I was uh, a little worried if, if this was TikTok, I don't think I would have been able to make it work. But Instagram is just about my uh, level of tech expertise. So. <laughs> yeah, I, I, have, I don't. I don't. Get, I don't get TikTok either, brother. Don't worry. Yeah, me either. <laughs> TikTok Complete is like. Loss. I'm like, yo, TikTok is not my generation, for real. <laughs> I'm What's good. You can see on, me. Man? You can hear me. Yeah, yeah, I'm good. Yeah, I'm I can good. hear you good. I can hear you well. The, the baby just went to bed. I'm uh, so excuse me if I look a little tired. This is my. Uh, <laughs> this is usually like my sleeping time. I try to sleep no, whenever no, he does. I'm you know? sure. Oh, Marsha Hugs is on. Marsha Hugs just joined. Oh, Marcia, Marcia, thank you for you? joining us tonight. I Our appreciate star. all of her spirit and energy. She's awesome. Yeah, she's uh, her spirit stays with us all the time. That's just a, a beacon of positivity right there. Absolutely. Well, yeah. thank you for joining me tonight, brother. Of course. Glad to see you. This is great. Good, good to see you. Good to see you. Fatherhood looks good on you. That's Yeah, I'm sure. There's some more extra <laughs> bags under my eyes. And, uh... <laughs> Look, I'm sure there's a whole lot of parents on here that say, you know, we get it, you know. Yeah. Once the baby is in, in bed, he can actually get some time to himself. Right. No, it's been amazing. It's been a, it's been a quite a quite a few years. He was born right before the the pandemic hit, probably two months before. And uh, and you know it, it's kind of it, you know in some ways it's a bit of a blessing in disguise because like if you know, if we were gonna time it, why not time it when nobody else is doing anything for <laughs> for a year? <laughs> right. You know you don't have to worry about your lack of sleep. We're just staying home anyway, so it's not like we have to rush to the office or anything. We kind of get used to that to that rhythm and just kind of focus on him. But uh, but for the first year, he didn't really know anybody else besides my wife, me, and you know yeah. whoever was on TV. <laughs> right, exactly. And 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 you guys have it all to yourself, you know. Nobody's going in and out, and and you don't have to worry about requesting time off. You can just be like, "Look, we're all home anyway." Exactly. Yeah, I was worried about vacation days, like right before that all happened. Am I going to have enough to to raise a kid and take time off? And it turned out the world just changed for us. So, <laughs> well, you, you, know. well, you look happy, man. I'm glad to see it. Yeah, yeah, no, it's been a, it's been a good stretch. A good let's stretch. talk. Let's talk about uh, Julian Quinones because I, I think the one thing that I always have uh, admired about you is your ability to do so much, yet be so humble. Oh, and thanks, man. Not, you got you carry a certain grace and humility about yourself, and um, I don't think that people know exactly all that you've had your hands involved in and all the things about the television you've contributed to. But um, I'm just so happy to bring that to this stage so to, to, just to hear you talk about it. So what was the first step for you moving into, um, uh, I know your, your dad has been on the news for years. He's, uh, he's iconic, people know who he is. But for yourself, like, what was that like, making that decision to say, listen, this is what I want to go into? Well, it was, you know, it was kind of a zigzag 
uh, entry into the industry. I, I, I came to spend a summer with my dad here in New York back in 2009 and didn't really know what I wanted to do. I was, you know, I, my degree is in, in marketing. I was trying to make beer commercials was my, my goal in life. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, I, I had quit my job and just at the time I just said, you know, I'm going to go spend a, spend a summer with my dad, reconnect, try to, try to just hang with him. And through hanging out with him, I met people that were involved in, in this world and in both in, both at ABC news, but also in independent films and, and in, you know, actual ser film series. And I met some folks on, on set who uh, gave me a chance as a PA on uh, a show back in 2009 that filmed all across New York called The Gravity. Uh, it was only one season, but started Bing Rames and uh, uh, Kristen Ritter. Um, and it kind of filmed in every different borough around the city. So we got to kind of bounce around a little bit and it was a good just introduction into like what, you know, what the city was, where everything was laid out, how people work. And a, a quick, quick lesson in just what a grind working on set is as a PA, <laughs> uh, you know, the long hour, you're, you're there before everybody starts, there after everybody leaves, trying to wrangle walkies and, and keep track of, keep track of everything that's going on. Um, but, you know, that was, that was kind of my start. That was three months of uh, just baptism by fire into the industry, into one that I had no experience in really. Um, and it gave me enough of, of an entry into the door for people to know that, you know, I did one successful job and now I could be ready for another one. Now that next one happened to be working the overnight shift at ABC News, so, <laughs> where I actually met my wife. My wife, my wife uh, was working at the assignment desk across, it was really just two yeah, of us. So. <laughs> <laughs> she was across the room and I was like, you know, very slow to kind of approach, but, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but it was a good way to kind of, you know, take my time and, uh, and, and get to know her before, uh, before we became serious and everything. And, and uh, you know, she, she's a star. She's still at ABC, at, uh, at NBC now. Um, but that's where we, we originally met. And, and that was my kind of first foray into network news. So I, I worked there overnight for six months uh, on the weekends, which is kind of rough, Friday nights, Saturday nights. <laughs> and uh, so any kind of early social life I developed over here went out the window. But, uh, but it was worth it because they just saw that, you know, there's somebody who's driven who wants to wants to be better at, uh, at this and, and they gave me more opportunity going forward. Um, and yeah, that led to, that led to my brother, you know, eventually my brother came to the city. Um, he studied at NYU for four, for four years from 2009 to 2013. And that's where I met you. I got to tell you about that too. I met you in prison on, on set. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. Bergen yeah. County Jail, that's right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> And, and, and I would tell you, uh, I don't think I've ever told this story publicly. Um, how that all came together was very interesting for me because I was working with, I might have said this to Tuffy Questel, I was working with a, a casting office um, and we they had got a deal with uh, ABC to do uh, the ABC Fall promo. And I was John King on a stand in. Oh, wow. How did okay. I not know that? When was this? What year? Yeah, I'm telling you, man. This is, this is the backstory. <laughs> um, this was, I'm going to say this had to be maybe about 2011, 2010. Wow. Yeah, so that's right that time. That's, that's right yeah. around that year. Yeah, I was, I was John Quinones' stand-in. Wow. I had wanted to get on What Would You Do? I had wanted to do the show. And um, I didn't know how to go about figuring out how I would how I would get on. So I ended up asking the producer who was doing the um the 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 stand in the, the 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 promo and he looked at me like why are you talking to me? Oh my God. <laughs> right? So Jeez. I was like, oh shit. Then I'm kicking myself in the ass because the casting people that I'm working with are looking at me like what the fuck are you doing? <laughs> right? So I'm sitting there and you I'm like, I can't your believe bounce, it. I just, I'm, yeah. in, I'm kicking myself in the ass because I'm like, I know better than to do that. Right? <laughs> Fast forward, maybe, maybe the same, the week after. This is how close all of this happened. The week after, <laughs> I get an audition to audition for a um, NYU film. I get to NYU. And there's an old security guard down uh, at, at, at the, at, 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 by the elevator. And he holds me down there for 10 minutes, right? 
And I'm sitting there pissed off. 10 minutes go by, he asked me for my ID. So I'm like, what the fuck are you asking me for my ID for? <laughs> I'm down for 10 minutes. You asking me for my fucking ID. If oh, I wanted geez. to blow the place up, I would have blew the place up. Wow. By now, so I go up there, so I go in there. I go into You're the fired room. Up. I didn't know, I didn't know who Nico was yet. Didn't know oh, who man. Nico was yet. I go into the room and I'm pissed, which I never do in audition. I'm pissed. And I say, look, I'm sorry. But the asshole downstairs, if you're looking for people, the asshole downstairs is keeping people down here for 10 minutes. You know perfect. what I mean? And, 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 uh, and the, uh, I think I was, the character name was like Fat Shit or something like that. Yeah, yeah. And he was supposed to have an attitude, right? right? So I'm walking away, and, and Nico's like, oh, no, 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 it's cool, it's cool. So I'm just like, I do the audition, and I leave, and I'm pissed, oh, right? Man. And I get the call back. And I'm like, is it? And I said, Nico Quinones. And I'm just like, fuck, I'm not familiar. <laughs> then I get the call sheet, and it's like Nico Quinones, Julian Quinones. So I get the set, and it's you. And, and then the whole family. Right. And the guy walk in with Dunkin' Donuts. <laughs> and I'm just like, what the hell is going on? <laughs> you got the whole like, team. See? You tried like, to, I'm telling you. And, you just gotta and, let the universe and, do it. It was crazy. So Nico was like, "Come on, man. We you the way you came in there, you you was it from the beginning." Right. So, and yeah, I don't think no. I've ever shared that story publicly with anyone. No, I didn't. That's, I didn't know that at all. I know that's that how it all happened. Even sure. Yeah, I just I just remember us uh, all the work we had to do to try to get uh, get that jail set up for that for that yeah. scene. It was wild. We, 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 we shot we shot we shot that film uh, in an entire block. They had yeah they had a whole wing. Which this is like you know one of my first producing jobs and and uh, and Nico came to me and he was asking to 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 try to get an authentic you know like part of a jail that we could that we could film in, and I was like yeah it might be a little tough I've I have never produced anything before in my life <laughs> but you know I'm, to, I'm already like kind of hedging I'm like you know what if we just find like a brick wall and like we say like you know that's the side of the jail and uh, he's like no like I think we should really try so of course I, I you know I went around cold calling all the different jails in the tri-state area yeah. and most of them you know it was like laughed at me off the phone one of them we went to go scout and they they had sent security to chase us off the premises like what you want to put cameras on our <laughs> on our lawn and uh and then the one that called back i think my email must have got him bounced to like his like higher up whoever it was it was like somebody like in charge of the district um of bergen county and so that person sent it down to like the warden of the jail and that guy just opened up you know the velvet rope for us he just like opened up the doors for us and we we walked in and we we uh we literally brought fence fencing into a jail to make it you know to fit the scene i, re to do I, this re scene. I remember that i remember that to bring six giant i think they were like 10 by 10 pieces of fence that we that we brought in and not only that but they had the inmates help us bring them in and i remember at one point i was between the lock like you're coming into the front door and there's a part where they kind of lock, lock one door and then the other one, you got to wait for it to open so that nobody can just run through. And we're stuck in there and I'm with this fence and I look to my right and my left and it's two inmates right next to me. And I'm like, wow, all right, how did I end up over here? And it's crazy. <laughs> you know, I, I, work, I worked for the jail system for seven years. Wow. I yeah. So I, 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 You're a New Yorker. I, yeah. No, no, in Maryland. When I lived oh, in Maryland. Maryland. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I worked there. So and, and I don't remember... Where we where we shot at? Let me just say that these were the most gracious, helpful, yeah. security, uh, not security, but correctional officers that I've ever met. Because I know in the Baltimore City jail system, they are not nice people, and they, yeah. they, they were so accommodating to us while we were there. Man, it was unbelievable. I think as far as prisons go, that's about as pleasant an experience as you can, <laughs> you can hope for. And they had that whole wing that was just empty. They just say, "Oh, we have an empty wing. If you guys want to, you know." filming here at the control center of the whole <laughs> the whole operation so we uh you know we got to we got to really add some scale to that to that film and that that brought it to life but uh and but shout yeah, out you just to, gotta take yeah, a shout, shout out to yeah. nico man nico yeah nico he, work, he working with nico, he nico is like spike lee the second you know he, he he's very and he worked for spike that. that summer he worked on red hook yep. summer so he you know he That's was coming right. off that energy red hook summer yep and uh and yeah, he you know he he obviously respects respects uh, respects Spike so much, but um, but yeah, that 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 was an experience. That was a good. So uh, needless to say, I love the Kenyonis family. Yeah, you're honorary Kenyonai. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he worked with that <laughs> on every type of production we can do. <laughs>
<laughs> you've been yeah, on ABC, yeah. but yeah, you've been on the independent films, you've been through it all with us. So how long were you at ABC? I was at ABC for, let's see, I guess I started in January of 2010, so, and I left in 2014, so a, bit, a solid four years. I worked okay. four years and then, you know, minus those six months doing the overnights, but the rest was with my dad on uh, what would you do producing producing that series and you know one of just the best experiences i've ever had uh, working on a show i mean I'm, i still get nostalgic thinking about all the different uh you know scenarios and and uh and teams we worked with we had some great people um it felt like such a big operation because you know you walk in there it, right now i'm like part of a team of you know three doing the news you know i have my correspondent i have my co-producer but back then it was you know we have my dad is a correspondent, but you also have this whole production crew who's responsible for setting up these hidden camera scenarios. They go in, they put the cameras in every corner. They, uh, they, they set up a little control system and behind the scenes. And then you have your whole production crew from ABC and other 10 people. So, so, you know, you walk in with like a team of like 20 to 25 people, including the actors who come out and, and you just have a, you know, it's like you're going to war together for a day. You, you can really kind of get on the same page. Um, and that was, yeah, that was just, you know, a, an experience that's never been replicated for me like that. That, that was just uh, such a big collaboration and, and for such a uh, authentic, you know, kind of ethical cause. We were all trying to really get to the to the core of humanity with that series. So, uh, the heart of America. Really exactly. The things that yeah, you know. get, uh, it's, you know, I, I tell people all the time, it's like the only real reality show. These people that are on there, they're not housewives who know that there's a camera in their bedroom. This, these are... Uh, these are actually nothing against those shows. Those are very popular, but, but this is like, you know, authentic in the fact that the people that walk into our scenes have no idea that they're being filmed. They're reacting in a genuine, authentic way. Um, yeah. Only afterwards do, do they realize that, you know, this was all a setup. And, and so you get a sense of how people actually would react if this, if this scenario took place um, yeah. across the country. And that makes it both timely and, and, uh, and just always relevant, you know, like a, Somebody, you know, when I first started, there was, you know, just grumblings here and there. The show's already been on for four, four seasons, five seasons. How are they going to keep coming up with new uh, ideas? They've already done this one. It's probably not going to last more than another few seasons. But I was always, like, pretty steadfast in the fact that this is an evergreen concept. This is something that could last forever because the same scenario you do today in 2021, you're getting different reactions than you got in 2011. In 2011, one of my first pieces that I produced was about a gay marriage proposal. And at the time, I remember doing the research, looking through the archives, trying to see what, you know, big dignitaries and politicians have said about the subject before. And, and you know, Obama, I think his most progressive statement on it was that my views are kind of evolving on the subject. Uh, but even he wouldn't come out and say, like, I just, you know, steadfastly support this. And this is just 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, Whereas if you do the same exact scenario today, you know, you have, you can, you can just imagine that the, the temperature of the country has changed. The temperature of the country is different. So every time you do a new scenario, um, you know, it's, it's always different. Not to mention the fact that you just have different people that walk in and everybody reacts to things differently. So, um, you know, I see a lot of value in that series and uh, they've unfortunately had to take a bit of a hiatus because of, of COVID and uh, and and uh, in not it's not a good time to get into people's faces and ask them how they feel about it, about things. But uh, but they're going to get back to it uh, pretty soon, and uh, can't wait to see what they have on deck. Because the world is always changing, and it's always a new issue on the table that we need to talk about. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Right. So. Yeah. There's no end to to the amount of scenarios you can come up with. You just got to keep thinking about what people are talking about. What's on. What's on the dinner table? What are you overhearing on the bus uh, out in society? You, you want to gauge something? Let's just let's just go out there and, and, and test it. And uh, and you know, there's there's just so many new ways that you could do that now. The cameras have gotten so much smaller. The uh, the equipment's better. You know, we used to be kind of confined to finding these kind of almost like sets in the real world that we have to set up. But but you know, I just see a lot of opportunity in, in that kind of space to really. Uh, modernize the way that they, that they get perspective from from the everyday folk. And I think that even even if you wanted even if we wanted to go a little more riskier with it, it would be a little a little more challenging and scarier, you know, because the, I feel like society has become way more aggressive 
as a mm-hmm. book, you know. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, that's something I'm kind of glad we didn't have to deal with <laughs> during my time there. I mean, it's not that the country wasn't polarized, but it wasn't so in your face, kind of distrustful of, I guess, the media at that time. And, you know, we did some road trips where we went kind of down to Route 66 or along the south. And there, there was people that were like a little more apprehensive of, of having camera crews around there and and, uh, and people filming them without their consent, obviously. But, you know, like I have to caveat that with we don't put anybody on, on or we, we didn't uh, with the show put anybody on who didn't actually want to sign a release afterwards or didn't want to appear on, on TV. Um, but there's, you know, there's just so much of a distrust and, and hesitancy right now with um, with the media that that would have been one extra hurdle to have to, to jump through uh, to film a series like that now. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I hope we kind of get past that. I, I hope the temperature is kind of dialing, dialing down a little yeah. bit. So there's, there's a little more openness to conversation and, and all that, but, um, but you never know. Climate change. Climate change. And, and moving into what you're doing now over at CNN. Yes. Um, I think uh, it's, 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 much, it's on a much larger scale. I think it's more brilliant. It's beautiful, brilliant, necessary, educational. It's all of those things wrapped into one. And I just wanted to know from you producing the shows that you are with Bill Ware, that um, how, how personal of it is it to you? Ex- extremely. I mean, this is uh, it's something that I was always interested in. It was it was one of those subjects where, you know, I've been reading about climate change and, and about the planet and how it's changing for, you know, since I was in college. Uh, but I never saw a pathway uh, into, you know, doing it pro- to doing it justice professionally, to studying it or to, you know, becoming a scientist or <laughs> doing whatever it takes to like really engage in the subject. And the fact that I was able to uh, kind of meander my way back back into that field after this long kind of zigzag path, I mean, I just feel so grateful that I'm able to actually engage in this as, as something that I'm already passionate about that just somehow found its way back to me professionally. Um, back in 2014, you know, there was a, a producer, uh, Cassius Kim, who was a good friend of mine who was over at... Uh, at ABC with Bill Weir. Bill Weir was also there. They worked together. They went. To, they came over to CNN and they started a series called The Wonderlist, which is, uh, it was a documentary series modeled after the success of Anthony Bourdain uh, at CNN, the success of these uh, documentary series, travel documentary series. And it was about, you know, how, how are places around the world dealing with, uh, how, how are places around the world dealing uh, with change from every single level, not just like species exist- extinction, um, not just their culture changing, not just climate change. And so it gave us the opportunity to kind of bounce around to 24 countries over two and a half years, three years, yeah. and literally just take the temperature of places around the world and what, what their biggest challenges are, how they're changing, how people, what people are afraid of, um, and muse about what are they going to look like in by 2050 by the middle middle of the century and what you see is that this is something that's being that everybody's affected by it's like it's not just something that you see in the low-lying islands of the south pacific or in places that are experiencing drought or central america where their crops are, are failing it's every single place you go you see the signs of it you see people that are trying to deal with with, the, with these just dire situations. And, you know, as, as you start to see how normal this is, we, we kind of evolved from that to, to looking at our own country, looking at the US. Um, and when the series ended, we, you know, we, co- we started covering climate change for CNN. Bill's the chief climate change correspondent for CNN. And they said, just go around the, go, go around the country, go take a look at how each place is, is dealing with things. And I swear that year, I think it was 2017, 2018, you know, there was Hurricane Maria, there was, oh, sorry, the Hurricane Maria, yeah, um, Hurricane Irma, Hurricane Maria, um, the Paradise Wildfires, Hurricane Michael battered the Florida coast. You know, we were traveling around and there was always a place in the US that looked like a disaster zone where there was literally homes like just destroyed, either burnt down or blown over. And 
you start to realize that, you know, as much as we don't see these, we, at the time we didn't see these images every day, that parts of the country were always going through this. Um, so that was just a big awakening. It was that not only is this becoming like a new normal, but it's, it's widespread and, and things that you would associate with maybe third world countries or places around the world that are going through disaster zones is actually at our doorstep. It's happening here in the US. Um, and so that was, that was a crazy awakening. And so, you know, we were kind of there at this tipping point uh, of the conversation where you started to see more and more people recognizing this, more and more people speaking out. And, and now it's, it's been wild to see the evolution to the, from the point where this was a debated subject, just, you know, like I said about gay marriage, like 10 years ago, this is a debated subject four years ago where people still didn't really believe the science. And right. all of a sudden, um, all of a sudden it's, it's now common knowledge. This is now part of our national dialogue. It's not, it's not is this real anymore? It's what are we gonna do about it? Um, and so it's just, been, it's just been fascinating to kind of be uh, on the front, front lines of that to see, to see how people's mindsets have changed and to you know, get inspired by, by work that people are trying to do to, to solve it and to adapt. After all of what you've seen and experienced while doing this, are we in the 11th hour? Yeah, I mean, you, you don't want to say like that there's no hope because there is hope. There's a lot of hope, but um, but you know you have to make peace of the fact that there is a lot of damage that's built in and that we're going to keep kind of experiencing in the short term. Um, you know that that doesn't mean to throw up your hands and say there's nothing to do. There's plenty to do, and we should start right now so we can minimize the effects going forward. But um, but yeah, but we're we're at a point where that where you know, it's been kind of swept under the rug for so long that we, we, we need to start taking action now and trying to, to change the course of this big shift that we're on, you know. What are some of the things that we can do that could help? Well, it's, you know, it's, my, our correspondent Bill always says it's not really on, you know, it's, it's great for you to take personal action, to demand change and to use your voice. That's, that's the strongest thing you can do. Uh, when it comes to like, you know, you should recycle more or you should like try to, you know, be more environmentally conscious, eat less meat. These, these are all things that also help, but it's not on you. That's, that's kind of a, a mindset that's been uh, foisted upon you by corporations. They've tried to make the responsibility be on the consumer. It all goes back to, um, back to you know, the old advertisements they used to make about the crying Indian on the side of the road who said only, you know, you stop littering and you should be recycling these cans instead of throwing them off <laughs> out of your car window to the side. That was... That was, in, it was funded by the bottling industry because they didn't want to be responsible for their own packaging, their own, their own waste that they're putting out into the world. And we're supposed to, you know, as, as consumers feel bad about that and try to, and try to, uh, try to remedy. So, so yeah, I think, the, I think the key is that, you know, you use your voice to try to just demand change, try to, try to make, make this even more of a new normal, make it known that we all understand that this is something that, uh, has been baked in for the last century, but that we, uh, but it's not, you know, on any one person to make the change. It's on, uh, it's on us to just use our voices collectively to, to force the change makers to actually go through with new policies and to be more responsible as corporate, as corporations. The one thing that, um, that I noticed with COVID when we went into shutdown is um, there were conversations about how there were things that were, um, cleaner um that fog for that had been over cities for some cities had lifted because we were all home um there were there were there were uh, dolphins in places that people didn't know were there before right and there was no one the, the humanity wasn't polluting there was no one driving there was yep. there, there was no toxins going into the air and i thought to myself man it took a pandemic that quickly to see how things kind of just shift because I think that um, the earth, just like our body, do you know how we get a cut? The body has all the cells that it needs to repair itself. Right. And the earth is similar to us. I think that it knows what it needs. It has everything it needs to repair itself. We Absolutely. just take care of it. Yeah, no, the earth is, is gonna be fine. It's just, you know, are, are the species on it? Are, the, are we gonna be you know, able to experience the same kind of norms that, we, that we've been used to? But yeah, no, I know exactly what you mean. I remember looking out my window uh, in the very early days of the pandemic, not seeing any cars down, looking up at the sky and just seeing clarity, stars, you know, like just like, 
it felt like the planet just took a breath for a second. It's like we were just going nonstop since like the industrial revolution and the earth was just like, whoo, yeah. Let's just catch our breath for a second and figure this out. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, you know, it's, it, it, it was great and very quickly kind of returned to, to normal course. Uh, less people started taking public transportation because they were worried about being close to each other. So everybody was driving in, you know, within the course of about two or three months, it, it became the kind of thing where we were back to, to pumping more into the atmosphere. And the problem is that a lot of that, a lot of that, um, a lot of the, the uh, carbon dioxide that's already in the atmosphere, it just takes centuries to, to, to decompose and to, and to drop out of there. So even though we had this momentary kind of breather of uh, we're not polluting as much anymore, all that stuff is still kind of sitting there. We're just not, we just weren't for a moment pumping it back up, pumping it all the way up there. Um, so yeah, so I mean, it's been nice to kind of have that breather and, and hopefully we can, we can continue to reduce our emissions. But, um, but yeah, there's work to do in terms of either removing it or, or to just, you know, finding ways to reduce our, our impact. What do you guys plan on tackling next? What, if you can talk just a little bit about sure. coming next, what's coming next as far as uh, what we can expect from you and Bill, we're collectively working together on this project. Yeah, we're, um, well, we're, we're constantly on the lookout for stories, but one that's kind of on, in, our, in our mindset right now that we're, we're thinking about is, is solutions. You know, we spend so much time talking about is this real versus, you know, people that were doubters trying to make sure that it's part of the public consciousness and then trying to just give people the reality of the science and, and, and where we are and show them the reality of America and what we have going on across the country. But now it's, we're trying to strike a bit more of a, of a hopeful investigation into who are the people that are looking for solutions and what are those big ideas. And are some of them opening Pandora's box? Are some of them kind of dangerous in a way? Um, you know, if you if you try if, to if fix things, stop you for one second. Just, sure. Here's what I don't understand when we talk about the doubters. Mm -hmm. What is doubting? Doubting for me is something that you can do if you don't have physical evidence of this thing actually happening. You just said you can go to any anywhere in the country and it's always something happening related to climate change. So mm -hmm. how is it possible for people to still doubt when the well, evidence that, is right there? In the, it in the is. Outside? And and I think it's a combination. Part of this tipping point that's happened over the last few years is a combination of the fact that, that they're seeing it because it's being forced into their faces through social media or through uh, through the, the, the actual media, <laughs> or, and it, you know, there's just a lot more in your face kind of reporting of this that's happening now versus what there might have been five or 10 years ago. But, but you know, that, during that time, the, the doubt came from the fact that there was interest that were, that were both sowing doubt into people to say that this is just part of natural cycles that we go through as, as humanity, and also th through the fact that it wasn't happening on that person's doorstep at that exact moment. Um, there's also there's also the sense i mean it, not directly related but there's a sense in the in, the, in this country because we're americans that you know we want to be strong enough to withstand any of these any of these changes we want to rebuild you know you go to these disaster zones afterwards you always see whatever the town is uh signs like you know this town's strong and we have like hashtag this town strong and it's, and it's a lot of pride that we take in being able to overcome nature and being able to overcome these things that, that happen to us um and so there's a there's a little bit if it's not doubt directly there's a little bit of kind of like you know yeah yeah that was a good punch nature but like you know what else do you got kind of mentality that that, that kind of comes at us um, and so I think that was in play a little bit as well but but the more people that have been talking about it as as a reality the more that you see uh, everybody's minds kind of changing on it and and I've seen that in the dialogue we've had with almost everybody. Uh, over the last few years, that it's become the kind of thing where we don't have to kind of tiptoe around it anymore. We can just talk about it as, as fact, the same way that you talk about gravity or, or any other kind of science. What comes next now for you all? Yeah, so next, uh, so one of the ideas that we're thinking about is talking about solutions. We're, we're thinking about uh, geoengineering. The idea that uh, so right to that point about how we can kind of overcome these, these things that are foisted upon us. What are solutions that people are looking at that that could 
potentially remove this carbon dioxide from the atmosphere or that could you know, immediately have an impact on reducing uh, emissions. And, and there's, it's just, it's an interesting thing because a lot of the solutions out there are things that could also have unintended consequences. You know, so one of, one of the big ones that we were kind of researching was this idea of cloud seeding where uh, they take these high level, uh, I believe it's sulfur. Uh, I could be totally mis misrepresenting this chemical, but it's, uh, I believe it's sulfur that they put in the atmosphere so that it reflects sunlight back out into space and therefore immediately has a cooling effect on the planet. Um, now th there was a team out of Harvard and uh, that, that's been researching this, but what are the unintended consequences of that? Could that potentially have a reverse feedback where it just you know, immediately has a, too much of a cooling effect on, on our society and then you yeah. know, does other kind of damage? Or is there, or is there impacts of just having that, that other molecule uh, out in our atmosphere? Um, so things like that, things like that, there's, you know, there's studies about how, how can we genetically uh, engineer corals to be more uh, resistant to uh, acidification in the oceans. Um, so that as the temperatures rise in the ocean, they become more acidic. These corals don't have bleaching events as, as we're used to, but they actually can withstand it and continue to thrive. Um, that's, that's probably what we're going to be looking at for early next year. Um, but for, for the moment, we're, we're just work, finishing up work that we've been doing and uh, trying to work on a couple of documentary projects. One that we have coming up is on, on Greenland. We went out to the ice sheet uh, there back in May. Follow yeah. a team from the geological survey of, of Denmark uh, out onto the ice. And, you know, it's one of the craziest experiences I've ever had in my life. We just we landed in Ilulisat. We quarantined for five days and then we got in a helicopter and we went for about an hour into the Greenland ice sheet, which is just, you know, from the helicopter, it's just white. It looks like you're flying through a cloud at a certain point. You just keep on going into the, into the blankness. It's like you're in purgatory. Yeah. <laughs> but we touched down and watched these scientists do their thing. And, and, uh, and it was cold <laughs> and it was windy. <laughs> Uh, but, you know, it's just inspiring to see the, the lengths that some of these researchers go to to just give us, to sound the alarm, to kind of tell us what's happening. Are the, the world. ice caps melting? Absolutely. This yes. is the Greenland ice cap. You know, this, this place that we went to, um, the Jakobshaw Glacier, which is the calving front uh, of the glacier near Lubasat, is the biggest glacier on the biggest island in the world. Uh, Greenland is, is the biggest island in the world. And it pumps out last uh, July, I believe, it pumped out and it melted enough water that it could have covered Florida in two inches of, of melt water. <laughs> the entire state of Florida <laughs> in one day wow. in Greenland. And that's accelerating. That's, that's the kind of thing that's that's become this, you know, as, as it gets warmer, as the, as the ice gets darker from melt, it absorbs more heat and it becomes a positive feedback loop where, um, where, you, where it more and more is melting at the same, at, uh, as, it, as it continues to heat up. And so to stand there on the edge of this glacier and just watch these giant chunks of, you know, stadium size ice, huge blocks that you, they look like little towns floating out to the ocean you just, you realize how small you are and you realize that, you know, for anybody who says that we can't impact the world, we're too small to have, a, to have any kind of impact on, on nature. Like we're doing it and, and we're nothing compared to the size of this thing. So it was an incredible, incredibly humbling experience. We, we stood there on, on this corner for a day. We kept going out to this one spot and just staring at these giant chunks. We were under quarantine, so we weren't really allowed to interact much, but but we were able to kind of wander around to the edges and just get some fresh air. And so it was a, it was a moment where we really just got to kind of stand there and take in uh, just the epic scale of what's happening. Do you feel like you're making a difference in the work that you do? Yeah. I mean, like, you know, that maybe it's hard to kind of judge on a per story basis. Cause you know, we do a story for news, it, it airs. You know, everybody's very excited about it for the day. And then you move on to the next one. Uh, and it's hard to see what the real impacts are. But when you look back at it and you think that, you know, we've been doing this 
exclusively produced since 2017, telling climate stories for CNN since they first came up with a chief climate correspondent. They first decided to assign somebody to that full time. And you think about how the conversation has changed. It might not be that we're uh, personally having an outsized impact, but collectively, you know, we've helped that conversation reach, reach a national and, and worldwide level. And, um, and that, that's very rewarding. Um, I don't, I don't think I have the temperament or the energy to do uh, any other kind of news really, because I just, you know, you have to be very passionate about it. And, uh, Absolutely. and sometimes the, the hours are tough that, you know, they'll ask you to kind of get up in the middle of the night and jump on a plane and leave your family and, and to go tell a story. And if you don't really care about it, it's, it's hard to kind of do that justice. But, um, but with this, I feel like it's, it's worth it in a lot of ways. And you go out there and you, and you whatever lack of sleep there was, whatever, um, whatever time you spent having to chase this thing, whatever stress levels you encountered, it was, it was worth it because we helped move the national dialogue um, a little further down the road. And, you know, people get their, their news from all over the place now. It's not like it used to be where, it, you know, one report on ABC back in, you know, 1990 would have been a groundbreaking thing where everybody's talking about it for, you know, it's, it's, it's as memorable as it was back then. Now some people will see our, our report. Some people will see something else from, another network, some people will see something on social media, some people will read about it in the magazine. Um, but it's nice to know that we're a part of that. And that's, uh, that's kind of work that I want to that I'm passionate about. And I want to continue to do. And I'm sure as a father now, um, it's even more intensely personal, because you think of, of course, what kind of a world am I passing on, I'm leaving to my to my son or daughter. Yeah. Yeah, no, Luca's going to have a, a different world than, uh, than we had for sure. Um, it's interesting, you know, Bill, Bill talks a lot about um, the shifting, something called the shifting baseline syndrome. And it's the idea that as, as time goes by, you, you're less aware of changes because you, you, don't, you don't experience them on a, on a daily basis. Essentially, like, you know, if nobody who's born today is going to know that there's no dodo bird that lives because they never experienced it. It's not something that they were, that they were there. And so every, every new generation, this is the world that they're coming into and they're, they're not going to be potentially quite as, as affected by understanding what that used to be like, that maybe the skies were a little bit clearer. Maybe the water was a little bit more pristine. And, and the fact that, uh, you know, I, I take a little bit of solace in that and that, you know, he's, he's coming into a world seeing where it is and, and I'm going to try to explain to him what it could be. And hopefully he can kind of take that forward. And, but, uh, but I think they're going to be a little bit more uh, resilient than us because they're not, uh, they're not coming into it with that nostalgia, you know, the way things used to be. Yeah. Yeah. Right. The good old days, the good old days, <laughs> the, the, the days that I like to kind of live in from most of the time. Anyway. <laughs> So I want I want to ask you my I have five questions that I usually ask every day to come onto my show. All right, is it the lightning round? What is, is this? <laughs> huh? This is, is the, lightning the lightning round. round. This right. is the lightning round, sir. Here so we go. Please. What do you know about this business um, <clears throat> that you know now before you came in that you didn't? Oh. Know? That's a good one. I should have, I should have studied before this one. What, what do I know now? Uh, <laughs> I know that it's I know that it's a very small world. That the, the you know that the people that you work with in the early days are going to be people you see around for for a very long time. Everybody's kind of on their own little journey, and and you think that when they leave or when they go somewhere else, that maybe that's the end of that chapter. But no, they're still there, they're, and they might come right back around. You might, you know, they're just yesterday, one of my best friends, got, uh, Bob, who actually worked with us on the Velvet Rope, he was there at, and on What Would You Do when we were filming out in, the, in Long Island. He worked with us on the show back in 2011. And just yesterday, he was hired for CNN Plus, came into the office, sat down next to me across the room. I was like, this is like a decade ago, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Um, but it's like that with, with everybody, you know, people, it, it seems like, some, yeah, it seems it seems sometimes like things are very important in the moment uh, that you might have, you know, lost a colleague or that, or that you lost an opportunity, but, but it's a small world. And, and if you, if you're good to people and you, 
and you're uh, humble and people enjoy working with you, there's going to be other opportunities that come around in a roundabout way where you'll get another chance or somebody's going to remember you and the time they spent working with you and offer you an opportunity. Um, and I wish I probably didn't stress as much about, about those relationships potentially ending in the early days because uh, cause those people are still around and they're still doing great things. Yeah. Leave, leave, leave someone a great experience of you, they'll never forget it. Right. Definitely. Yeah, and you and you don't know what path they're on. They could be offering you. They could end up being offering you an opportunity years from now that you know you haven't even thought of at this moment because you don't know where they're going to end up, who Absolutely. they're going to meet, what opportunities end up on their doorstep, and and you know if you really are a good person to collaborate with and and they enjoyed working with you, that might be another another opportunity for you down the line as well. Without question. So, what advice would you give your nineteen year old self? Oof. Yeah, it's another another good one. <laughs> My 19-year-old self was working at a at an electronics store, like the Canadian version of a of a Best Buy at the time. And he was doing all right. He uh you know, that that job was was good. It, it was at the time when LCD TVs just came out, so I was making commission off those and it pretty much put me through college, which was great. <laughs> um but I would I would tell him to dream a little bit bigger, you know, like in in those days, I, I didn't see the ceiling. I, I thought the ceiling was much lower. Um, it might be because I was, you know, hanging out in Canada and I, I had my life there. I hadn't yet been introduced to, you know, coming to New York and, and hanging out with my dad here and seeing all the opportunity that there is in this industry and all the ways that my passion could be kind of taken forward and, and things that I love to do. Um, but I, I wish I could have told him that, that was something that is not only possible, but it's, it's, probable if you really start doing your research right now um, and trying to trying to get you know get yourself going trying to trying to learn at an early earlier age i uh, i went to college for marketing because i thought that that was the only i had really good grades in business in school and i thought that was the most creative way i could make use of those business grades you know not being an accountant but you know, maybe if i go into marketing maybe that somebody will let me make commercials one day and if I make commercials, maybe I can make videos that are, uh, or maybe I can, you know, do uh, beer commercials that are funny and, and, and make somebody laugh for a moment of the day. But that was like kind of my narrow look at my way of having an impact through being creative. And I never thought that I would one day have the opportunity to not only work for uh, different, you know, series on both ABC and CNN, um, but to tell even, even bigger, more important stories around the world. So, um, yeah, I just would have. I just would have said, you know, be be more confident, and, uh, confident, and and dream a little bit bigger, because uh, there's there's a lot of opportunity out there, and uh, even though it doesn't seem like it in this exact moment, there there's going to be uh, chances down the road. What feature spirit? Oh, right now, I mean, my my boy, my my wife, and my boy, my family. I you know, I uh, I. I didn't think I wanted kids this bad until I, he actually, until I actually saw him, you know, I, I, I kind of, I kind of figured it would just happen one day. You know, you have a family, you're, you're going to, it's just, you know, you, you grow up, you get a job, you, you got a family, you, you have kids, but, but having them and, and, you know, despite the lack of sleep, that's the one thing where I feel like he could chill out a little bit, but, but uh, I, I can't even say that he sleeps great. He sleeps 11 hours a night and, and, you know, it, it gives us a chance to kind of, get our own schedules in order. But, um, but to that, to your point about what feeds my spirit, you know, I come home and I used to be exhausted after a day of work, stressed out, just kind of sometimes angry, thinking about all the things I did wrong or what I could have done better or what was expected of me the next day. And now I come home and I, I sit down with him and I, I look at him and he's intensely fascinated by a box, like an empty box, he's just like holding it. <laughs> And, I, and I'm just staring at this, like, what, where is this joy coming from? That's an Amazon, it's an empty Amazon box, not even a, not even a toy in there. Yeah. And, and it's, it feeds my soul because immediately I realized that it's, it really is that simple. It's just yeah. find something that's in front of you and, and just be completely immersed in it. And, and he lets me do that every day. I can just vicariously look through his eyes and see how he's experiencing things learning about the world learning about the world and uh and and it's just fascinating it's like an endless endless source of entertainment um and and it just 
it just shows me how small everything else is. Yeah. You know, we, we try to make things very important because we, we do this thing where we kind of do a debrief with ourselves when we, when we end each day. Uh, like I said, how could I do that better? Or, how, or what went wrong? You start to get into this void. And you need something to just snap you out of that and just say, yeah. look, you're still living. We're still breathing. Yeah. <laughs> There's yeah. a lot of love around you. Just, yeah. just focus on that. Just focus on what's right, right in front. And, uh, and that, that's, uh, that's been just done wonders for my soul. Truly. What do you want your yeah. legacy to be? What would you like your legacy to be? I, I want, you know, people to have, uh, you know, I, I want people to have, society to have benefited from work that I've, that I've done in some way. Um, when it comes to what I've done so far with what would you do, I feel like we, we had the opportunity to tell very personal stories that, that reinforce people's humanity, uh, faith in the humanity around them. So when people are having a bad day, if they can look back at some of those those episodes, some of those ones that featured Marsha Bonner in, in a barbershop, that you know, that, where they they saw some humanity that they didn't think was there. They thought this country's racist. This is you know, there's no we should we shouldn't have faith in people. We're all very different, um, and they got a taste of something that that was able to kind of reinforce that. When I think about the Wonderlist, the, the travel series about. Um, places in the world that are on the crossroads of change. Um, I, I hope that people take something away from that and they think that, you know, this, our, our problems here are, are big, but there's also, we, we should also take into account perspective, you know, like we're, we're upset because of, because of all the problems that we're dealing with today, but, but there's places that in the world where people don't even have food or, or, you know, yeah, I mean, there's starvation, just terrible things happening all around the world. And, and to know that, to know how good we have it, to be humbled by that fact, um, I think is important. So, I, to your point, to your question, I think it would be great to just continue to work on on stories that that give people a bit of a lesson and uh, and make them feel a little bit better about uh, the context of, of their issues in life and, and hopefully feel better about them. And Ms. Marsha said, "You're way too kind. Thank uh, you, for, thank you, Ms. Marsha, for staying with us. Um, yeah, she's still there." Helping us grow spiritually. spiritually. It, is something, grow. it is something that I will never, ever forget. And thank you. Eternal words. That gift that you gave us yeah. that night, truly. So what are you grateful for? Uh, I'm, I'm grateful for, for everything. I mean, I, you know, I, like I said, I, I never thought this kind of career or life would be possible. Um, I try to just, I try to remind myself to be grateful about everything. My, my problems having been able to travel the world so much. You know, my, my mom took me around the world at, at a very young age. She was a flight attendant for Air Canada. And so even before all this travel with the Wonderlist and with work, you know, I kind of had that sense of perspective that, you know, as good as, uh, as bad as things might seem here, they're, they're really not that bad. Um, they, could be, they could be worse. And, and we, we live probably in not only the best place in the world in terms of, of our quality of life, but also we live at the best time. We were born at a time in humanity where nothing's ever been better. <laughs> you can't go back. You can't say that, you know, 50 years ago was better than today. You can't say that 300 years ago was better than today. You can be kind of nostalgic about maybe a, the way a few things were a yeah. little different, but this is, but this is, you know, quite literally the, the best time to be alive um, that we've ever had as a species. And, and so, you know, both on the macro scale and on the personal scale, I'm grateful for, for everything, for every day. Amen. I'm grateful to you, brother. I'm oh, you too. I'm grateful that you took the time out to come and have the conversation with me. Anytime. I, I thank you for doing that and educating us uh, about what you do. And, and like I said, I'm always watching your work and I appreciate everything you're doing, everything that we can learn from. Uh, what you guys have to offer us and to continue to educate ourselves and hopefully uh, more people, people in power can start to do things that can really help change the trajectory of where we're going. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, fingers crossed. <laughs> yeah. We'll keep, uh, yeah. Using our, using our voices and, and hopefully, uh, hopefully that continues to go in the right direction, but there's, there's a lot of reasons to be hopeful. 
Yes, and thankful. And I wish you and your family a happy, safe, and blessed Thanksgiving. You probably do. Thanksgiving text with me anyway. So, but, but I'm. Not... <laughs> <laughs> I'll try to get you one before you before you send it over. <laughs> I'll find a, a bit emoji or whatever. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so... that's, my, that's my thing, man. I just want to I just want to let people know, man, that um, how appreciative and how just grateful I am to be a part of your circle. And I, of course, uh, thank you. Give your dad. I'm grateful for you best. too. I will. Shout out. Absolutely. So if I don't see you before the year's out. Um, you know, definitely have a blessed Thanksgiving, but hope we'll be talking soon, definitely. Yeah, we'll be together. We'll get uh, Grandpa Q together with his uh, his grandson, and uh, we'll send you a photo, and uh, I hope you have a great Thanksgiving also. Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right, have All right a you too. A special Thanksgiving, every, every, Thanksgiving, everybody. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you December 1st. God bless. So long.